Thank you, Darson and Sarah. Amazing, huh? We are a blessed church with so much people and talent and abilities. It's an amazing thing. Amen? Amen, we are. Uh, 12 1, you are dismissed at this time. Bye, guys. Bye. It is so good to see you today. Welcome to Grace Church. Thank you for being here today. We want to welcome those who are joining us online. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, if if you are new, what an honor it is to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, May God bless each of you today. I feel like Tiny Tim saying that, but God bless us, everyone. Amen. We are continuing our our Advent series called Tis the Season. And, And before we begin, though, I have a small quiz that I want to give to you. I want us to take, okay? It's the 12 days of Christmas quiz. Y'all ready for it? On the 12th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Now, is it golden or gold? Are you sure? Okay. Four, three, two, and a partridge in a pear tree. Right. Now, here's the big question. That wasn't the quiz. That was just to get you to repeat it. Here's the quiz. You all ready? Here's the quiz. Did you say four calling birds or four collie birds? How many said calling Okay, let me, let me give you a little, it's actually, when it was originally written, it was collie birds. A collie bird describes a European blackbird, okay? So when it was originally written, it said collie bird. Uh, listen, I just learned this like yesterday. I've been singing this all my life. But what happened is like in the early 1900s when they put music to it, uh, they changed the word to calling birds, calling, C-A-L-L-I-N-G. So originally it was collie, but if you sing it calling birds, that's perfectly fine too. That's the way it is today. So, anyway, there you go, a little Christmas trivia. Now you know a little more than you did when you came here, amen? Yeah. So Christmas obviously celebrates the birth of Jesus, but the story of Christmas begins long before that morning in Bethlehem. Approximately 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah the prophet spoke some words about this day. And when he spoke these words, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, and we don't have time to get into everything today because we're just going to relate it to the story of Jesus. But it, he's speaking also to people who are going through some really difficult and distressing, depressing circumstances. There's an army uh, prepared to invade the threat of wiping out uh, the Israelites. And, and Isaiah speaks, and he says in Isaiah 9, Verses 1, we're going to look there, verses 1 through uh, 6, or 7, 6, I think it is. And he says this, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea along the Jordan. So Isaiah uses really two vivid words to describe the, the way, what the people were experiencing. He, expre- he expresses it as gloom, and distress. Now, if you're old, you're probably thinking gloom, despair, and see, some of y'all gave away your age there. Anyway, we're moving on. That's hee-haw for those who don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Whatever it is that the people are facing, though, is very overwhelming. It's overwhelming them. They are in gloom and distress. But, But listen to what he says next. The people walking in darkness, so they're walking, that's how he describes them as walking in darkness, have seen a great light, on, the land, on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has done. People walking in darkness. It's a phrase used not to, to just, just to describe when the lights are out and you can't see anything. It's, it's a, a phrase that's used to describe a, the condition of some things that people are going through, but it's also one that later we see in the Gospel of John. John uses to describe a spiritual condition where people are hopeless and lost and in misery. If you've ever been in a dark room, one that you're not familiar with, and and tried to find your way around, there's no light. It is an awkward, eerie, uneasy feeling. And if you've experienced that before, then you have kind of the idea, just a small taste of what it was 
the people were experiencing that Isaiah was speaking to. They are people living in the land of the shadow of death. And that is a summation. The shadow of death is a summation for all the calamities of life and the evils of life. When we see a person who's going through a really bad, gloomy, and distressing time, we, we might say they have a, a dark cloud hanging over their life. You know, it's, it's a description of what's happening. And this is one of the things that when it comes to Scripture that I find so important and that speaks so much to me. Because the Scripture never treats our distress. It never treats our gloom. It never treats our bad circumstances lightly. It never treats them lightly. It never belittles them. It doesn't say it's no big deal. It doesn't make fun of them. But in the Scripture, we see that God truly cares for us. That He sees us in our distress. He sees us in the situations of life that we find ourselves in. And He works and moves on His time. Not our time, but on His time. He acts on our behalf to help us and to, stay, to save us. You know, darkness, distress, the shadow of death, those aren't things that just happened in the past. Some of you today are experiencing those things. And these are real, real life experiences. But they are not the only real experiences in life that we can have. Thank God, he says, that even though there is distress, there is darkness, and there is the shadow of death, Isaiah tells us that a light has dawned. A light has dawned. There is a light dawning in your darkness. There is a light dawning in your distress. There is a light that has dawned in your shadow of death. Matthew tells us that the light that has dawned is none other than Jesus Christ. And that is what we celebrate at Advent, the coming of Jesus, the light of of the world. Yes, it is true. There is darkness. There is distress. There is the shadow of death. But it is also true that a light has come. Jesus has come. He has been born. He, he became a man. He lived his life. He died on a cross. He rose again. Death is defeated. Sin has been overcome. He is reigning forevermore and he is coming again. Now the question for us especially if we are believers, is which reality should shape our attitudes, thoughts, our words, and our actions? Is it the darkness, the distress, and the shadow of death, or is it the light that has dawned? May I encourage you today to allow the light that has dawned, Jesus Christ, to allow Him to shape your thoughts, your attitudes, your words, and your actions. Remember this, Advent is in two parts. It's in two parts. It's a two-act play. The first is that Christ has come. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Christ has come. Isn't that good news? He has come. The light has dawned. Christ has come. And He came to save us from our sins. But the second part of the play is that He is coming again. And he will establish justice and righteousness. And he will make everything that has been wrong, he will make it right. Our hearts long for that time. See, he came, and when he came the first time, he established the kingdom of God within the hearts of those who believe and trust and obey and follow him. But when he comes again, he is going to establish his kingdom literally, physically, on this earth, it's not just going to be within the hearts of individuals who follow and believe Him, but it is going to be upon this world. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first time He came as a lamb to save us from our sins, but the next time He is coming as the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Two parts. But the problem is we're stuck in the, the middle of this story. And Advent tells us this. We're, we're stuck in the middle of the story. There is darkness. There is distress. There is this shadow of death that hangs over all of us. But the light has dawned. But we haven't seen that light fully realized yet. And, we're, and so we're stuck in this tension of now, not yet. We still live in darkness and distress and the shadow of death. But we also live in light of that dawning light, Jesus Christ. 
And that's one of the challenges that we have as people. We celebrate His birth and what it means. But we anticipate and we long for His return and what that will mean. Now, Isaiah prophesies in this next portion some things that are going to happen. And, well, actually, at the time that he said them, they were things that would happen. Now it's things that have happened and still things that are going to happen because some of what he said has come true. And when Isaiah speaks, prophets sometimes do this when they speak for the Lord, they'll speak of something in the past tense, even though it's a future event, as if it's already been accomplished. They'll speak of something as if it's already happened, but it is a future event. Uh, l- listen to what he says here, verses 3, 4, and 5. He says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. It sounds like something that's happened, right? But it hasn't happened yet. It's a future event. They rejoice before you as people rejoice as the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the pl- plunder. Listen to the next one. For is in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. You've shattered that. Sounds like something that's happened. And yet, there is a future note to this in what he's saying. And then he says, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. This is something I want you to see here about this. What Isaiah is doing is he is picturing for people who are caught up in this distress, this darkness, this shadow of death. He is telling them about a peace that is coming. There is peace that is coming. This is all about peace. It's like people who celebrate after a great harvest or who, uh, like when war ends and the plunder is divided. If you ever saw pictures from D-Day or a video of that and the celebration that happened because the war ended, it was an amazing thing. The burdensome yoke of oppression, the rod of oppression, that is the power of oppression, that is shattered. It, this is, again, pictures of war and the promise of peace that is coming. And he says the clothing of war that is soaked, it is rolled in blood, that it will be burned and used as fuel for the fire. So there is this imagery of war here and a promise of peace. And how many of us, oh my goodness, how many of us today long for our world to have peace? Tired of war. Tired of conflict. Tired of death. You know, there's the old saying, can't we just get along? And, and there is something in our hearts that longs to. And then other times, we don't want to get along, do we? World War I was called the war that ends all war. Sadly, it isn't true. Don McLean says, Washington has a large assortment of peace monuments. We build one after every war. Because somehow, peace never lasts. Isaiah anticipates a coming peace. And he explains that God is going to bring it about, and he explains how God is going to bring it about. He says to us in verse 6, For to us... A child is born to us. A son is given. I want to pause here for a moment because I want you to notice how Isaiah phrases this, okay? He says, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now, I know how a child is born, but how is a son given? It's easy because he is talking about Jesus here. Jesus is the child that was born of a woman, But He is also the Son of God who has been given. For God so loved the world that He what? He gave His one and only Son. So in Jesus, we have the fulfillment of this promise of the one that is going to bring peace. Listen to what He says. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on His shoulders, and He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. So we have here now the promise of peace. God is promising peace to his people. And there are several beautiful titles here that we could talk about about that are given to this baby that is born. 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I want to just focus on that, that last one, Prince of Peace. But let me, let me pause for a moment because there was one part of this that I always struggled with, everlasting Father. Did you ever struggle with how Jesus is the everlasting Father because there is God the Father and Jesus? So how is the Son the Father? Do you ever struggle? I struggled with that for a little bit. Let me try to explain it to you so it will help. It is through Jesus that the role, the, the, the reality of the Father is extended. Does that make sense? Because Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So through Jesus, the Father's presence is present in him, and it's made known to us. And this is why Jesus is described as having the role, the title of everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. It isn't a royal term per se, but what it does, it describes the nature of his rule. He is the Prince of Peace, and he rules in peace. He is the one who is of peace. And so Advent celebrates the coming of the Prince of Peace. And it's good to know today that the Prince of Peace has come. The Prince of Peace has come. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And you and I, we might rightly wonder, we might rightly ask, well, if He's the Prince of Peace, and if there's been the promise of peace, where is the peace? If, if He has come to rule and reign in peace, where is this peace that was promised? And again, to be honest, our world is not exactly a peaceful place, is it? There's violence, there's corruption, there's war, there's injustice, there's hurt, there's pain, there's brokenness. And, and when we see these things, it kind of mocks the idea of peace on earth, a prince of peace who rules and reigns in peace. And if you ask, where is the peace, that's a good question. But before we answer that question, I think there's a much more vital question we should ask. What is peace? What is peace? A lot of times we define peace as something like the absence of, the absence of conflict, the absence of turmoil, the absence of trouble. It's to have a life where, where things aren't happening that are bad around us. And that's how we often define those terms. And I just want to tell you this. If, if that's how you define peace, then when you hear the promise of peace and you look at the Prince of Peace, you're going to be disappointed. Because though that is how we define peace, the question, another question we have to consider is, is that how Jesus defined peace? Is that the kind of peace that he promised? Rome, Jesus was intimately familiar with Rome. Rome enforced and demanded peace. It was their requirement for peace that put him to death on the cross. Kind of a contradiction, isn't it? They had to keep the peace, so they had to get rid of Jesus. And that's the way it was with Rome. Anyone that would agitate or stir up things, they were quickly dealt with. They were crushed under the heel of Rome. Rome kept peace by force. There was a philosopher, a Stoic philosopher named Epictetus, who realized that the absence of conflict wasn't enough. That wasn't the kind of peace that people really longed for. He realized that we needed something more than some kind of externally applied and enforced peace. He said this, he said, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than more than uh, even for outward peace. Do you hear what Epictetus is saying? He's saying it is possible because he experienced this with Rome. Rome made sure there was peace out here. But the problem was that Rome, though it could give peace out here, it could not give peace in here. And he said the problem is what man really needs, more than peace out here, though we want that, what man really needs is peace in here. And that's the problem with humanity. That's the problem that we deal with. And it's, it's possible. Now, which would you rather have, peace out here or peace in here? Well, actually both, right? <laughs> I'd rather have both. But 
But human history shows us that that's not likely to happen. Because plenty of people have lived when there's peace out here, but there hasn't been peace in here. And it's possible today. Your life is good. Things are great in your life. You couldn't, you couldn't ask for things to be better. And yet inside there is this turmoil. You are not at peace. The Jewish word for peace, so this is the peace that Jesus was talking about, is shalom. Shalom. And it means wholeness, well-being, health, prosperity, security, soundness, and completeness. And the thing that I want you to see about it is that it is ultimately, first and foremost, about something in here, inside of you and me. And Jesus spoke of this inner peace that exists and endures in spite of outward trouble and turmoil. The Prince of Peace spoke and he said this, I have told you these things. He was talking to the disciples. They are like just totally down, telling them what's going to happen to them, what he's going to experience, what he's going to go through, that he's going to die. And they just, they can't take anymore. But Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You may have shalom. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, two important things here that I want to show you real quick about this. Two important things about this. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of God. It is God's presence in our lives. In the midst of our turmoil and trouble, that's where our peace comes from. Because Jesus says that in me, in me, if you are in me, you are in my presence, you are mine you will have peace. He is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. His presence is with us. Peace is found in the presence of God. And you can look into many different things in many different places to find peace, but there is only one place, one source, one person who can give you the kind of peace that your heart longs for, and that is Jesus Christ. And it's interesting here Jesus didn't mince words. He said, you will. <laughs> All right, isn't that what he said? You will. You can bank on it. In this life, you will have trouble. But Jesus, Je here's the thing that Jesus did. He didn't promise to keep trouble from us. He promised to give us peace that would keep us in our trouble. Does that make sense? He, 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 didn't, he didn't promise the absence of conflict peace. He promised a peace, inner peace, that would keep us while we're going through our troubles and circumstances in life. And if that sounds like the kind of peace that your heart longs for, I have some great news for you today. Luke says that today, talk about on that Christmas morning, in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And when they announced it, do you ever wonder why peace is associated with Christmas? It's because the angels announced that it was peace on earth, God's goodwill towards men. That's why peace is such a prominent part of Christmas. A Savior has been born, Christ the Lord, the Prince of Peace. We didn't get a reformer. God didn't send us a reformer, a teacher. He didn't give us another religious obligation. He didn't send us another Caesar. He sent us a Savior who is the Prince of Peace. So peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of God in our lives. But listen to what Jesus said. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have Think about that for a moment, because what is it telling us? Well, when we know about Jesus in his life, we know that he faced some difficult circumstances and, and he went through hell on earth. And he ended up being crucified on the cross and dying for our sins. But he overcame it. But what I want you to see here is that there is a price for peace. 
The peace that he gives us came at a cost to him. He had to overcome the world in order to give us the peace that he promised. Does that, do you see that? Peace always carries a heavy price tag. Peace is never free. Peace doesn't just happen. There is a price to pay for peace. If you're familiar with Flanders Field, it's located in Belgium. It's a beautiful scenic place now, but in December 24th of 1914, it was a rainy, muddy bog where British and French forces were entrenched on one side and on the other side were German forces, sometime no further apart than 60 yards. That distance between the entrenchment was known as no man's land and it's the place where that was littered with bodies in fact it was so bad that that uh, uh, it was it was it was it was just a wasteland of bodies it was horrible Stanley Weintraub in his book Silent Night the story of World War One Christmas truce he describes an amazing scene that happened on that 24th of December in 1914 German soldiers put up on the parapet the, of the trenches, started putting up some Christmas trees and lighting them. Soldiers on the other side sh shot, and then they heard singing going on, Christmas carols. And they kind of inched closer to see and hear what was going on. When Christmas Day rolled around, the soldiers were fraternizing. They were hanging out together. They were celebrating. They were sharing what they had with one another. And together they took up the hard task of burying all those dead bodies. They ended up playing a soccer game. This, sounds, it, this, this was an amazing moment in the middle of an ugly, ugly war of peace on earth. But sadly, it didn't last. A few days later, the war resumed, and, and the toll, the death toll, was over, I think, 8.5 million worldwide and 21 million wounded. Just as there existed a, a place called No Man's Land between those two entrenchments, that really describes what has happened in our relationship with God. There is this no man's land. We're entrenched on our side and God is on his. He hasn't done anything wrong, but we have sinned against him. We've made it our will, our way, our wants. It's all about me, God, what I want, not what you want. And, and we've all done this. We have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all went after our own way to do our own thing. And sin creates that no man's land. It creates that estrangement. And when there is estrangement, there is no peace. And you know this because you've had that happen in your relationship with others. You may be experiencing that right now in your family where, where you are estranged from someone. And because you are estranged from them, there's this distance between you. It's a no man's land. No one crosses it. And there is no peace. And that's exactly how the Scripture kind of describes our relationship with God apart from Christ. We're stuck in this place where He's on one side, we're on the other, and we're not venturing out into no man's land. So at Christmas, what we celebrate is the incarnation that God crossed no man's land. He came to us. He did what we could not do and made Himself known to us so that through His Son, through the Prince of Peace, God bridged the gap between us. He, he crossed the estrangement and he brought peace so that we could be, have peace with him. You see, Christmas is about innocence. But it foreshadowed a cross. He's going to be named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Paul in Colossians 1.20 said this, God was pleased through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
This is where peace comes from. And this is the price that had to be paid in order for us to have peace. And if you want to find peace at Christmas, there's only one place to find it. Jesus. It's not... And, and there's good things we can look to and find enjoyment in. We can look to our family, to our friends. We can look to other relationships. You can, you know, there's nothing wrong with wealth or fame, you know, but, but those things can't really give you the inner peace that Jesus, only Jesus can. And he is God's gift to us. See, the promise of peace is made by the God of peace who gave us the Prince of Peace who paid the price for our peace. And this peace, first and foremost, is peace with God. You can have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, then you experience the peace of God. You see how that works? You can't get those out of order. You don't get the peace of God without having peace with God. But when you have peace with God, then you can experience the peace of God. And here's, here's the thing that happens. After, after that is dealt with, after God is the Prince of Peace is ruling and reigning in your heart, guess what begins to happen? Now you begin to have peace with others because it isn't meant to be contained here. He extends His rule and reign through us when we live in peace with others and we allow His peace. And listen, today, listen, you, you, may, you, you may need to call someone today because I'm sitting here talking about this and talking about estrangement and you've got someone on your mind right now you know you're, you're estranged from. There's a price to peace. Are you willing to pay a price so that you can have peace in your family, in your relationships? Will you be the one to reach out? Will you be the one to make the call? Will you be the one to work to restore the estrangement that exists? You see, that's what Jesus did for us when he came. He crossed no man's land, and he offered his life as a sacrifice so that through him, our relationship with God could be restored. And when we have peace with God, we have the peace of God. And I want to pray for you today. Because I know some of you are dealing with darkness and distress. You're upset. And it may be today you're here, you're lost, you're in darkness. Spiritually, you're lost. I want you to know today that the Prince of Peace has come. God, if you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear me on this. God loves you. You are precious in his sight. You have worth in his sight because you were created in his image. And he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son so that through him, you could have everlasting life. You can have peace with God and then experience the peace of God. So if you're, you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you haven't put your faith, your trust in him, would you do that today as I pray? You know, Jesus, I may not understand everything, but I, I know, I believe that you're the son of God and that you came. And I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. And if you're here today and you're going through a period of darkness, Remember today that a light has dawned. We are, we, we are stuck in this tension of a now, not yet. We haven't seen the kingdom of God fully realized. But don't allow the darkness to shape your thoughts, your attitude, your words and actions. Allow the light that has dawned. Allow the peace of God that passes all understanding. Allow it to begin to rule and reign in your heart. Amen? I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we live in a world in turmoil. We live in a world that is divided. We live in a world that is dark. It is broken. There is hurt. There is pain. There is corruption. There is violence and war. And God, how our hearts long 
for peace. And thank you for the promise that one day you are going to establish your kingdom on this earth and there will be peace. But until that day comes, you can rule and reign in our hearts. We can have the peace of God. And I pray for those who are going through difficult times and distress and darkness. God, would your light just begin to shine in their hearts? Would you just lift them up? Would you pour your peace into them? And may it rule and reign in their hearts and lives. And Father, if there's anyone here today, they do not know Jesus, the Prince of Peace, as their Savior and Lord. Father, they've been looking in other places. Things are good in their life. They could look at their life and, and there's very little conflict or turmoil, but yet God inside, they... They are not satisfied. They don't have peace. And you're calling today. You're calling for them to come home, to come and be reconciled to you. Thank you that you made it possible through Jesus. And only through Jesus can we experience the forgiveness of sins and be reconciled to you. And thank you that through Jesus we can have peace with God. And I pray today that they would put your, their faith their trust in you, that they would follow you and walk in obedience to you. And that as they do that, not only do they have your peace, but they will experience the peace of God in their hearts and lives. And as we celebrate this Christmas, oh God, may we live in the awareness of your rule and reign, the Prince of Peace. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Everybody said, Amen.